Hello film fans and welcome to this episode of The Shilokian. Now a few weeks ago I reviewed Monsters Resurrected and while I thought that was um, quite a fun watch it did suffer one from a huge amount of historical inaccuracies and two from the fact that it kind of its production was a bit ropey it really reused a lot of its CGI sequences and once you notice that it does actually become quite amusing to watch to be honest, I kind of view it less as a documentary and more as just a kind of like fun, silly kind of action-y show almost. But I mentioned in that review that I thought that um, the kind of the um, the premise of the show and the idea of using technology and um, paleontologists to try to discover stuff about interesting prehistoric animals was done far better by another show, The Truth About Killer Dinosaurs, and that's what I'm reviewing today. Now, first things first, I'm a massive Bill Oddie fan. Now, I realise that a lot of my audience lives in America, and I'm not actually sure, quite sure how much Bill Oddie is actually known in America, um, but he's quite famous in Britain. He was um, a famous comedian um, long before he ever presented any wildlife documentaries, but he's a very successful, very famous bird watcher, and he's absolutely brilliant. As a kid, he was probably my favourite wildlife presenter, even more so than, say, David Attenborough, um, just because he really seemed to have a good time. David Attenborough always seemed very serious when he was in front of the camera. Um, and that's obviously brilliant for what he's um, attempting to show. The documentaries he narrates are very serious, big budget BBC um, uh, series, and they kind of uh, benefit from his kind of gravelly gravitas um, when he's talking to the um, the viewer. But Bill Oddie seemed to have so much fun when he was in front of the camera. He would like muck around with the camera crew. He'd always be smiling and joking along. And I think as a kid, and to be honest, even as an adult, I really kind of enjoy that kind of thing. I like the idea he seems to be having a really good time as he's going along with this um, um, series and when something quite funny or silly happens he's not afraid just to have a bit of a giggle um that's some absolutely brilliant bits in this show and uh, particularly when they're doing the experiments like for instance when they swap a turkey <laughs> with their replica of an ankylosaurus tail where, where he's re he really gets a really good giggle and even the paleontologist who are supposed to be sitting there very seriously looking going oh yes that seems to be about the right kind of damage that that would normally do <laughs> um instead they just go hey <laughs> because the turkey's just been swatted across the room um so i liked that and um, they weren't kind of afraid just to have a good time which really I think kind of benefits the series as a whole but um, the truth about killing dinosaurs um, it basically there are two episodes and they're both kind of based on two separate premises the first looks at um, t-rex and triceratops and basically tries to uncover whether t-rex actually hunted triceratops and if it did how did it manage to kill it the second one looks at velociraptors and basically just goes into a bit more detail in their biology. You know, the things that um, maybe the normal viewer would take for granted about velociraptor, like it hunting in packs or it having a big claw that can disembowel its quarry and it's being incredibly intelligent. Uh, all that kind of stuff that we kind of associate with um, raptors, mainly from Jurassic Park, let's be honest. Um, it goes into a lot of detail and says, you know, what well, is it true? You know, what do they really look like? How do they really behave? Um, and what kind of things did they hunt? So I really enjoyed that and it kind of gets a good balance between looking at the fossil record and then also basing um, some kind of more suppository evidence on kind of um, like modern day behaviour of things like crocodiles or birds of prey. Um, it, they spend quite a lot of time looking at things like alligators, they also do a few experiments with birds of prey just to kind of see how they react and kind of see what we can extrapolate from that um, current modern day behaviour which I really enjoy. That's kind of how I relate to a lot of dinosaur stuff anyway so it was really kind of a brilliant kind of thing for me to see being done on screen um the other thing i really enjoy about it is they do some really great experiments as i've uh, just um made mention of um i think they, they have four basically uh, for each of the main dinosaurs they look at they have um, a replica of a t-rex um bite um using like uh, premium grade steel and the hydraulics and what i really enjoyed about that scene was when i reviewed monsters resurrect i was a little bit kind of skeptical as to how they were kind of got to the point where they made their model they don't really go into a lot of evidence and i kind of i did actually say on my review you know is keratin the stuff say a terror bird's beak is made out of as strong as steel i mean i don't know i mean it might well be but they don't give any evidence to support that they just make a model and smash stuff with it this is much more accurate in the sense that it tells you exactly the kind of the bite force there First of all, how they calculated the bite force using an alligator and then kind of scaling it up. 
And secondly, then how they um, came to build it and why they use things like steel, and um, because it's basically the only thing strong enough to kind of show how powerful their jaws were. And then how they actually, what the bite force is and how they're actually putting that through the model using the hydraulics. In fact, actually their estimate of about four tons of bite force is actually, I looked it up and it's quite conservative. Some people say it's as high as six tons. So actually that in itself shows that they were clearly doing a kind of more academic kind of look at uh, T-Rex because they didn't just say right let's make it six tons so it's like really impressive on screen they were actually attempting to try and find out things of how it might genuinely have worked um, so I really appreciated that um, then they do things like they um, sort of try and see whether you know Triceratops is really capable of kind of ramming things with its horn a bit like a Monday Rhino does um, so they um, basically make like a crash test dummy out of like a carbon kind of polymer that sort of replicates the um, Triceratops skull. And then they make a replica of a Velociraptor claw and then Kylosaurus tail um, again really, really cleverly um, to try and, you know, have a look at how it would actually work in real life. Um, and I really, really enjoyed those bits because they weren't afraid just to have fun with it, um, <laughs> which I also enjoyed. You kind of have this kind of dichotomy of on the one hand you come all these you know, serious academics and your know, engineers and um film prop makers you know really you know interested in their craft on the other hand you have Bill Oddie sort of just hanging around going hey when it smashes something um which I really enjoyed um I think my favorite scene when they're kind of testing stuff and what the first thing that I really enjoyed is the bit with the Velociraptor claw where it actually shows that a Velociraptor's claw and while it's actually very capable of piercing stuff is not capable at all of ripping like it does say in films in fact I don't actually remember seeing uh, Velociraptors disembowel anything in Jurassic Park. Maybe I just got a terrible memory, but they certainly do that in the book. And I think it's kind of implied in the film, but they couldn't show it just because the rating would be too high. It would be like R rated, wouldn't it, if they disemboweled you know, a person. Um, but that I really, really, really did enjoy um, because it actually makes quite a lot of sense. Um, I remember thinking when I first watched this series or quite a while back, I thought, yeah, of course it does. Of course it didn't disembowel stuff because the edge of the claw um, even on a modern animal, it's not serrated. It's like sh quite, it's like sharp enough probably to go ow if you touched it. But it's it's kind of smooth. It's not like a point. Um, so it wouldn't rip. It would just tear into it. And then it makes even more sense when you look at a kind of the Velociraptor's biology because you think, oh yeah, their teeth. They've got like lots of little sharp teeth, but they're not very big. So the idea that they've kind of they've and evolved a claw which is much longer than their teeth, which they can then kind of use to stab specific parts like say the jugular art and the jugular um, vein in the throat or uh, through the um, the windpipe or just you know to hold their prey down so they can bite it more easily that makes total sense and it makes far more sense than just disemboweling something um, which is let's face it not a particularly clean way of killing something um the other bit I really enjoyed is the bit which, when they were just, you know, basically just being silly. And they even admit as much that they just wanted to see what would happen when they used the T-Rex skull to rip up a, a mini, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. I mean, there's got these great scenes of, like, the kind of the T-Rex's bite just clamping down on um, the mini, the, on the top of the mini, just ripping it to shreds. But it's very impressive because it does actually show you how powerful a T-Rex was. And you kind of think... Oh, yeah, that, that is scary. But I think even more impressive is the bit when it ripped a pig carcass in half because it really shows how a T-Rex would actually have used its jaws. It doesn't just bite. It bites and then rips backwards with its head. And the, the power and the strength it really illustrated with that just quite simple test when it just literally tore the carcass in half, it makes you think, oh, they, they really are scary, aren't they, T-Rex? Um, you really wouldn't want to go and face one, you know, <laughs> never mind in a dark alley, you wouldn't want to face one at all. Um, it really gave you a sense of how terrifying they are. The one thing I did th think of when I watched the first episode was that the CGI is a little bit um, basic, shall we say. I mean, I really enjoyed the bits where it showed the, um, the T-Rex actually fighting the Triceratops and when it kind of bites down. It really gave you a good sense of the power. And the, actually, the T-Rex model is quite good as well. It looks a little bit slimmer than a lot of T-Rex models, say in things like, again, like films like Jurassic Park or um, even in like the Jurassic World series, um, which they make the dinosaurs quite heavy set. It looks a little bit slimmer and sort of more rakish. Um, but I did think when it ran, it, it, it's a little bit cumbersome. I mean, it's no worse than anything else I've ever seen, but it, it wasn't quite, didn't quite give the kind of power in the kind of the, um, like the sudden charge of the T-Rex um, as much as I might have liked. But the bit I really enjoyed is the second episode, which shows the Velociraptors. And 
the CGI for them is pretty good. I mean, um, they have feathers, obviously. That this this kind of the big selling point of this was it's got like feathery velociraptors in it. Um, maybe I might have enjoyed it if the feathers had looked a little bit more realistic. I mean, I think it was probably the best they could simply do for the time because obviously, um, CGI techniques have improved massively. I think my favourite velociraptors are still the ones in Prehistoric Planet, which is not really surprising because that's the most modern basically the CGI recreation we've seen of dinosaurs so it's not surprising it's also the best but the feathers on that look really good and realistic this you kind of see from some angles there's like feathery but others it could just be kind of fur it's it's a little bit kind of vague um but what I really enjoyed is the way it shows them running and that is brilliant it really gives a sense of power and speed I think they probably based it on things like ostriches or maybe even um, like the road runner um, and you get the kind of the bouncing gait from side to side as they put sort of one foot forward and one and they kind of you get the sense of their momentum and they also feel really fast as well um bearing in mind obviously they're about the size of a turkey um in some respects i think it kind of um the show um almost made them feel bigger than they actually were i mean it, it meant just multiple times they're the size of a turkey but the dinosaurs they're actually hunting are about the size of a pig so i think actually it makes them feel bigger and the camera angle makes them look bigger because it's kind of very low um so they they almost feel the, si the size you normally see on say you know you get jurassic park even though they are actually quite small um the other thing just to mention about velociraptors they do um and probably the other thing I really enjoyed was they actually recreated the famous fossil um, where they found a protoceratops and a velociraptor locked in combat um, at the point of death, probably covered by something like a mudslide or something. Um, and that is brilliant. The, the scene where they recreate that is, is fantastic anyway. But also the bit when Bill Oddie just looks at the fossil and just enthuses about it was so brilliant. Um, he just is so excited. And obviously I'm excited as well by that fossil because it's absolutely amazing. You just don't get fossils where you see the two animals kind of locked in kind of mortal combat um normally with fossils it's just you know a dinosaur lying on a lump of rock isn't it or the, or the impression of the dinosaur um so again the fact that we've actually got this thing and it's just his enthusiasm just kind of radiates out as he just goes around it and really looks at things in detail and looks at the kind of the way it's using its claw on the throat of the protoceratops it, it's just brilliant um and i really enjoyed his enthusiasm for that particular scene now, of course, when you're basing your dinosaur documentary, and Bill Oddie actually expressly says at one point, everything you're going to see is true. Now, when you say something like that, that's kind of provocative, isn't it? Um, and I have seen videos on YouTube where people go through it and go, well, that's not true, and that's not true, and that's not true. Um, and obviously, you're not. Ex I don't expect documentaries, particularly about things like dinosaurs, when it's so subjective, to get absolutely everything right. I mean, obviously, in an ideal world, you would want that, but I... I think it's kind of unrealistic. Apart from anything else, paleontology changes so much so quickly that you it, it seems almost a bit unfair to go back and look at something and go, well, we got that wrong, because at the time that was kind of what some scientists anyway thought. So you can't really argue that they got it wrong because for the time that was just, you know, modern scientific best a guess kind of theory. Um, the big thing I think you could probably go back and kind of point fingers at is possibly... Um, the idea that they talk about velociraptors hunting in packs. Now, they seem to suggest that this is quite certain, but actually the evidence for it, even back then, was kind of vague. It was basically based on two things. One, and we know that velociraptors seem to have hunted animals quite big, um, a lot bigger than themselves. Like, for instance, the uh, protoceratops is the size of a pig. Velociraptor is only the size of a turkey. So um, how did something like a velociraptor hunt something that was kind of significantly bigger than they are? Um, and the obvious answer is, you know, they were working together. The other thing is that they have found multiple kind of tracks of, um, I don't think they're actually velociraptors, I think they're, I think it's Dionychus, but it's kind of a similar kind of like raptor-like dinosaur all together. Um, so the, well, we know for a fact that lots of them seem to have, you know, converged on the same area. Now, People have argued that that could just be that they were kind of scavenging together. We know that things like crocodiles and Komodo dragons, while they don't cooperate together, will, if there's a big source of food, will kind of converge on the same area. Um, you see that in that brilliant sequence in life, for example, when the Komodo dragon kills a water buffalo and suddenly there are loads of big dragons descend on that area because it's a big, readily available source of food. Um, so I kind of, you know, the evidence is a little bit sketchy and they don't actually, to be fair, go into a lot of the actual kind of um, fossil evidence for want of a better word they they mainly just kind of skate over that and look at kind of modern animals like for instance crocodiles do show some level of cooperation um also they look at harris hawks which of course do show a considerable amount of cooperation but to be fair most raptors are entirely solitary almost almost always solitary they kind of hunt in pairs sometimes but apart from that 
generally they're just solitary. So you kind of think, well, yes, one group of raptors, one species of raptor, sorry, hunts together, but most of the others don't. So you know, make of that what you will. It, it, it's a possibility, but unlikely. Um, and recent research, I think it's 2020, so very recent, um, actually um, analysed, I think it was again Dionychus, um, basically what the young were eating and they found they ate different things to what the adults eat which is what you would expect with something like say komodo dragons where the young go off and hide up in trees because they're um the adults will eat them if they find them um wh whereas in something say like wolves or lions obviously which do cooperate together the and the young actually you know eat very similar things because obviously they're living together in groups so you know make of that what you will but i don't think it was actually um unreasonable that at the time they suggested that and um, so I kind of give the show a pass for that bit but yeah anyway I really 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 enjoyed this show it's absolutely brilliant um it's just uh, the right mixture of kind of academic um, um, kind of seriousness and just having a good time together with some really good kind of CGI sequences they do a really good job you can tell that they obviously work quite tight for the CGI budget um but they do a really good job of not reusing too many of the same shots they kind of use very similar shots but you can tell they've added bits to different sequences so while you sort of think oh yeah I've seen that bit with the Proteceratops running down the hill a few times you never get the sense you never get bored because they've always done something a little bit different or often have so yeah, um, I think this is absolutely a brilliant show, possibly one of my favourite dinosaur documentaries ever, um, and yeah, it's just an excellent watch, I would thoroughly recommend it, it's really good fun. Anyway, that was the Shilokian, thanks very much for watching film fans, um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel do feel free to do so, um, obviously there's the subscribe button down below, and there's also a link to my Twitter account in the description, um, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, goodbye.